Prachi, tell us when to begin. Yes. Okay. A oh, very good morning, everyone. And I'm Prachi Pasankar on behalf of uh, Pune Knowledge Cluster. I welcome you all to this webinar by Professor Raghavendra Gadakar. I may now call upon Professor Ajit uh, Kembhavi. He is the principal investigator of Pune Knowledge Cluster and uh, former director of uh, Ayuka Pune. The Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. <coughs> yeah, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to this uh, uh, webinar by Professor Raghavendra Gadakkar on Can We Learn from Insect Societies? Uh, Prachi Pasalkar will be introducing him in detail. Let me just say a few words. Uh, he's a very distinguished uh, <coughs> behavioral scientist, biologist. He has had a uh, history on working on these for many decades. And we first met uh, in the Indian School of Science, which I was visiting, and uh, his roommate in the hostel happened to be my friend. So that purely chance encounter over the years has gone on, and we have been uh, seeing each other, talking, and doing some work together also over the decades. And uh, he's a very fascinating, it was a very fascinating, it has spanned a very wide range. And if I remember correctly, when I first met him, yeah, he was beginning to work on elephants. So if you say that uh, the, uh, the, the, the mass of an insect is about one gram, okay, so then you really are talking of a few million of those insects fitting into one Indian elephant, okay. So the, which means that in astronomy, we would say that his work spans a wide scale, okay, for one gram to several tons. And uh, you will hear about it and he's going to talk about can we learn from insect societies? Uh, he has worked on insect society for many years, along with a lot of young people. And I'm sure that you'll really enjoy hearing about it, and as well as admiring the extreme dedication of all the people who have worked with him so hard for so many years to make all this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I now call upon Professor Surendra Haskardi, uh, who was associated for several years at Agarkar Research Institute and is the senior advisor at uh, Pune Knowledge Cluster. To kindly introduce Professor Gadi. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Gadakkar, whom you all know. But still, I thought that I will give you a flavor of his uh, wonderful biodata. Uh, Raghavendra did, did his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, in 1979. And he's particularly interested at the present time in animal behavior, ecology, and evolution, and origin and evolution of social life in insects. Uh, Raghavendra is now a DST Year of Science Chair Professor at Center for Ecological Sciences in, at Indian Institute of Science and non-resident permanent fellow of the Institute of Advanced Study in Berlin. He has published over 350 papers and articles. He's also published three books, two of these were published by Harvard University Press. The first one in 1997, Survival Strategies. The second, The Social Biology of Ropalidia, uh, that was in 2001. Recently, just a few months back, he has published an open access ebook on how to design experiments in animal behavior. This has been published by the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore. And I would uh, strongly recommend that you download it and read it. It's a wonderful read. He has been recognized by several awards, including the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, the Third World Academy of Sciences Award in Biology, and the Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. He is a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Science Academy, and National Academy of Sciences India. The Third World Academy of Sciences, Dio Poldina, the German National uh, Science Academy, is an international member of the National Academy of Sciences USA, and foreign honorary member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was president of INSA, Indian National Science Academy, from 2014 to 2016. He has served as a member of several committees, in, uh, including the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Cabinet Government of India. One of the things about Raghavendra that is quite extraordinary is that he started off as a molecular biologist and 
ended up studying insect societies. The trend usually is the opposite, the so-called reductionist approach. One begins studying an organism or a biological phenomenon and then tries to zero in on molecules and molecular mechanisms. There is a lesson here for all of us, especially the youngsters, that working with biomolecules or even nanoparticles for that matter, does not and should not stop one from asking and addressing interesting questions in organismal biology, ecology, or conservation. So with this brief introduction, I invite Raghavendra to begin his talk. Thank you very much, uh, Ajit, uh, Sunen, and Prachi. I am delighted to have this opportunity. Uh, I just want to make sure that people are able to hear me properly and uh, see my screen. Yes, sir, we can hear you and you can, see the screen. Hear, you know? Okay, wonderful. So, as I said, I'm delighted uh, to be here and to have an opportunity to speak to you. I will begin with my slides. So, I have called this Can We Learn from Insect Societies? And I want you to notice that the title is a question. And at the end of the talk, I will not answer this question, but I'm hoping that. Uh, you will answer this question in your own way, either in the negative, affirmative or in the negative, but I'd like you to answer this question. My goal today will be to make you think about this question. Can we learn from insect societies? It's not very interesting for me to simply give you my answer, but I really want you to think about your uh, possible answer. I will give you some facts along the way, which might help you to make up your mind. Uh, let me begin by giving a brief introduction to insect societies. Well, I must apologize to some of you who may have listened to me speak on this topic of can we learn from insect societies in recent times. This is one of my passionate interests at the present time. So when I'm asked to give a talk, I'm more likely to choose this topic than other topics. But I certainly enjoy speaking about it every time to different uh, audience. So as most of you would know, some species of insects organize themselves into societies. Most of them don't, but some of them do. And when they do, they exhibit very interesting special features. And I think it's quite legitimate to use the word society. In many ways, they resemble human societies. One might argue that in many ways, they are actually superior to human societies. They have division of labor, communication, uh, conflict, cooperation, everything that you see in human societies, you will find in one species or the other of insect societies. And that is, of course, one of the reasons why humans are fascinated by insect societies, because these are so far removed from us on the phylogenetic scale. They're so much smaller, so much simpler, such so much smaller brains. And yet they seem to do many things which are similar to what we do. And of course, we are interested in knowing how do they do this, in particular, how do they deal with the problems of social life that we humans are very familiar with. And we also are familiar, of course, with the advantages of social life. So how do they harness these advantages? How do they overcome the problems? And how do they, what is the proximate mechanistic methods by which they actually do all these things? It's of great interest to human beings, quite beyond uh, normal scientific thing. So it's of interest to everybody. But for evolutionary biologists, there is an even greater interest in insect societies because in insect societies, there is an extreme example of unselfish behavior or what you might call altruistic behavior. Members of these societies can sometimes, can often sacrifice their personal benefits for the sake of the group. Sometimes they sacrifice reproduction all uh, completely and work as uh, sterile workers to, for the benefit of society. And sometimes they may even commit suicide to ensure the survival of the group. So from this point of view, this kind of altruistic behavior, which is quite, which appears quite contradictory to the naive expectations of Darwinian theory of natural selection is one of the reasons why Evolutionary biologists are also fascinated by this. So there's a great deal of interest in studying this. The example that everybody would certainly be familiar with is the honeybee. Honeybee is a 
kind of uh, archetypal insect society. Bees live in large populous colonies. Uh, you can see they live in very crowded conditions. Uh, but inside a bee colony, you will find that there are only three kinds of bees. There is a single large fertile queen. There are a few drones or males and the rest of the colony, thousands, tens of thousands of individuals are sterile female worker bees. And it is the worker bees that actually run the society. They do almost everything that is required to run the society. They build the nest, they clean the nest, they process food, they feed the larvae, they guard the nest, they remove debris, they go out and bring food, they bring it back and so on. So they do everything. The queen basically lays eggs. She is more or less an egg-laying machine. But along the way, she also produces a number of chemical substances which are released from her body, which we call pheromones. And those influence the working of the society, influence, I won't say control, but influence the behavior of the workers. The males, interestingly, do not contribute to any kind of labor. They are really not participating in the domestic life. They are born on such colonies. In a few days, they mature and they fly out to attempt to mate with virgin queens from other colonies. And this mating usually happens outside any colony. It actually happens up in the air. And the males actually die in the act of mating, in the act of population. So the males have really no other function other than to produce sperm, transfer the sperm to virgin queens of other colonies and die. And the queens will then, of course, start new colonies. So it's a fascinating system. Uh, you can see on my next slide that the queen is substantially larger than the workers. And what this picture is trying to show is that the queen is usually surrounded by a small group of workers who we might use in a fancy phrase, we might say they are on royal duty. Because what these workers are doing is they're literally taking care of the queen. They clean her, they lick her, they feed her. It looks like she doesn't have time to do any of these things on her own. And she is moving around trying to find an empty cell to lay an egg. And all the rest is done by the workers. Actually, if you watch this live, you will find that as the queen moves, the retinue of these workers on royal duty sort of move along with her. Of course, it's a uh, philosophical question, who is the boss? Whether she is the captive slave of the workers or the workers are her slaves is, is, depends on your point of view, but they uh, coexist. They cannot live uh, without each other. After working uh, at home for the first half of their lives, uh, the workers will go out in search of food. Their food consists mainly of, or only of pollen and nectar, which they gather from flowers. And here you can see a bee in flight. Uh, what they do is when they find nectar, they suck the nectar and store it in their crop. This is a temporary storage place where it does not get digested. And they actually pack pollen grains in uh, what are called pollen baskets on their hind legs. And then they go home and they deliver all of this to waiting bees at home. Not only do they deliver, but when they go home, they perform a dance. And this is a, a graphic representation of the dance. Through this dance language, they actually inform other naive bees at home about what they have found. In fact, what they have found, how much of what they, what they have found, how far away is it and in what direction one should go to find it. And the bees at home, at least some of them, watch the dancer. And this watching the dance is a very interesting concept. Watching the dancer means you dance along with the dancer. So along with the dancer, these bee followers also perform the dance and get this information. And then without any further help from the dancer, they are able to go out and actually locate. It may be one tree, five kilometers away but they will locate that tree and they will bring back food. And if they also feel that the food is very good, they will also dance and other bees will join. So the dance language of the bees, which is an extremely efficient method of communication, but it's also in some ways reminiscent of human language because it's an arbitrary symbol of symbols of communication. And that is what human language is. So that's one of the, considered one of the greatest achievements of the insect society. And we will have occasion to talk a little bit more about the dance language of the bees, not so much in the context of foraging 
or finding food, but in a completely different context, which is when the bees have to make a new home. They have to find a new suitable site to build a new home. And there again, the dance language becomes very important. And I will talk about that a uh, little bit in the latter half of my lecture. Uh, what you see here is a picture, a rather spectacular picture of a honeybee, uh, which has stung a volunteer. And when the honeybee stings you, unfortunately, it cannot withdraw its sting from your body. That's because the sting has barbs pointing outwards. So it gets lodged in your body and the bee, when it tries to uh, extract the sting, actually its abdomen bursts and the bee flies away, but only to die within a few minutes. But on the other hand, the sting, which you can see here, and the poison gland, which is attached to the sting, and some part of its digestive system are left hanging on your body, almost invisible. But what is interesting is that this poison gland will come continue to pump venom into your body. And people have measured this for as much as 60 seconds after the owner has flown away, after the owner bee has flown away. And this will continue to pump venom into you. So next time you are stung by a bee, don't chase that bee because it cannot do any more harm either to you or to anybody else. But instead, uh, stay calm and uh, have the presence of mind to see if you can locate this sting and poison gland and actually remove it before all the venom is uh, pumped into your body. As you can see, this mechanism is extremely efficient. You can think of the honeybee sting as an extremely efficient venom delivery mechanism. But it comes at a cost to the life of the individual bee. This is, an ex this is the extreme altruism I was talking about. And the question how natural selection can favor individuals who sacrifice and do not reproduce is a great matter of great interest. Although I will not talk to you about that today. Now, honeybees, of course, are just one example. The other famous examples are ants. This is a picture of uh, weaver ants. These ants build large nests on trees using living leaves, which are actually attached to the tree. And their nest building is very, very elaborate, intricate, and complicated. You can see the number of ants that are required to take the edges of two leaves and bring them closer and closer. You can see that the ants build a bridge here. And then as they bring the leaves closer, a few ants in the middle of the bridge drop off. So the bridge becomes narrower and narrower, and then the leaves get aligned. When the leaves, leaves get aligned, it is remarkable that the ants will actually stitch the edges of these leaves together in order to make this nest. And in order to stitch this, they use nothing less than silk fibers. Now, where do they get the silk fibers from? Adult insects are not known to produce silk. But larvae are known to produce silk. Larvae produce silk in order to make a protective cocoon around themselves when they pupate to prevent desiccation. And what the ants will do at this point is in fact, one of the ants will go into the nest and catch hold of a fully grown larva. And as you can see here, again, I will use uh, human language, persuade this larva to donate some silk for the community good. And you can see here, this silk threads are being used actually to stitch these two leaves together. Now on the, I'm sure you will notice that on the part of the larva, this is again an act of altruism because if she had kept all the silk for herself, she would have probably built a very good, very effective, very protective cocoon for herself. Now she's sacrificing some of that silk for the community good. Termites are equally famous examples of social insects. Uh, here is a termite mound. We all know that these large termite mounds are present in Africa, etc. But this picture was taken from my bedroom in the Indian Science campus. So we also have these wonderful termites. These mounds, of course, are above ground. The real colonies usually are underground. And here from Wilson's book is an artist's depiction of what might the society look like underground. There are two remarkable things about termites, which are different from bees and ants and wasps. Uh, the main insect societies are ants, bees, wasps, and termites. Ants, bees, and wasps belong to one group, the insect order Hymenoptera, but termites belong to a different group, the insect order Isoptera. And Isoptera are quite different from uh, Hymenoptera, even in their genetic system. And therefore, the two major differences between termites on the one hand and ants, bees, and wasps on the other hand is that unlike in the hymenopteran insect societies, 
which are completely feminine monarchies they have been called because as i said the males don't participate but in term wise males and females equally participate in social life both at the royal level and at the worker level in fact you not only you have queen termites but you also have queen king termites so in the central chamber here you can see the artist has drawn a large queen and a little thing here he is the king he doesn't look very impressive but he is the king and in fact he constantly copulates with the female with the queen and uh, and and uh, pr transfers sperm to her on a regular basis throughout the life throughout his life and the second distinguishing feature of termites is that in many species of termites especially so called higher termites it is the juveniles it's the young ones that become workers so one might say that this is an extreme example of child labor in fact these young ones have are so busy working that they have no time to grow up in fact they never become adults they die even before they become adults again you can see the whiff of altruism in all of this the fourth group i want to talk about that is the third in the hymenopteran uh, societies is of course the case of the wasps now these are my favorite insect societies there are of course many 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 wasps which are not social but there are a few hundred maybe a few thousand uh, species of wasps which are actually social and all social wasps are called paper wasps and the reason why they are called paper wasps is because they build their nest not from leaves as we just saw the ants doing not from wax as we saw some pictures of honey bees not from soil as uh, termites might do but in fact from paper so you might wonder where they get the paper from they actually manufacture paper and if you wonder how they manufacture paper pretty much the same way that we would manufacture paper they scrape cellulose fibers from plants chew it up add various chemicals make it into a fine pulp spread it into a thin layer and dry it that's exactly how we make paper and indeed it is paper you can write on it here is a picture of a large uh, wasp society a large nest and the entire nest is covered with a paper envelope with just one small opening for the uh, for agents to go in and out the rest is all protected inside this and these wasps are quite dangerous but if you have the courage as i did just once in my life to open this in fact this particular nest which is in this picture i opened this with some risk to myself and i was rewarded by what i call a multi storied apartment complex inside this you will find the whole nest which is several tiers of comb all made of paper and so you can think of this as the ground floor first floor second floor third floor fourth fifth sixth seventh eighth so they are lined on on top of that. and all of these are used for rearing wasp larvae now you see here all these white jewel like things are the pupae the wasp larva spins a silken cap when it pupates and you can see here in multiple combs whole thousands of young larvae and brood are being produced who will of course become adult wasps and contribute to the society so i want to summarize some of the major features of insect society especially those that really seem spectacular insect societies as i said resemble human societies in many ways and are arguably more efficient than others in some ways they sustainably harvest environmental resources and there are many studies and uh, data to back up the sustainability of the way in which they harvest resources you can see there are many of these things which we try to do like to do sometimes succeed often fail they engineer their environment both inside their nest and outside their not not just inside their nest but also outside their they practice agriculture this is absolutely remarkable our agriculture is 10 15 thousand years old but their agriculture is 50 million years old and they have been practicing agriculture they do not cultivate angiosperms as we usually do but they cultivate fungi in fact like some kinds of mushrooms but they cultivate these mushrooms this kind of agriculture has been going on for 50 million years and what is really impressive is that a ant colony which practice agriculture may have hundreds of thousands even a million individuals and the daily food for all of these individuals adults and larvae comes from their agriculture produce not from what they collect in the environment they actually collect leaves from the environment shred it into pieces spread it out in their so called garden and inoculate this garden with fungal spores and when it grows 
the newly produced spores in the garden are actually used as food. I will say a little bit more about uh, agriculture. Insect societies, of course, have to fight disease. You see what crowded conditions they live in. They fight disease with a combination of individual and social immunity. In addition to individual immunity, they have a very specific phenomenon called social immunity. They organize social hunting parties. They navigate their environment using both terrestrial and celestial cues. And they have majorly influenced the evolutionary trajectories of other organisms on an evolutionary time scale. And the best example of this is their influence on the evolutionary trajectory of the flowering plants. The flowering plants have flowered, so to speak, in, phylo in phylogenetic terms, have speciated and produced large number of species, largely because of the aid of bees uh, so on other social insects, which cross-pollinate them. So there is a very seem to do them quite well. These are the things that we want to do. As I said, we sometimes succeed, sometimes don't. So I can't imagine that we don't want to think about this. We must at least think about this possibility, whether we can learn anything from insect society. However, there are, of course, difficulties. If we want to learn, there are difficulties. And I find it very interesting that the real difficulties are not with them. The difficulties are with us. We have difficulty in learning. They have no difficulty in teaching us. And I want to dwell on this a little bit. First of all, our, in our difficulties, there is what I would call a practical problem. And what is the practical problem? The practical problem is that we find everything in nature, the good, bad, and the ugly. So if we blindly imitate nature, it's not useful. We can find suitable examples in nature to justify anything we want. So if we are on the path of learning from nature, learning from insect societies, we have to be very careful because you can find everything. Just to give you a few examples, we can find examples for monarchy, slavery, murder, matricide, fratricide, infanticide, and simplicide. But if you are inclined in the opposite direction, you can find democracy, socialism, egalitarianism, altruism, self-sacrifice. Take your pick. And therefore, we have to be very careful when we decide that we are going to learn. This is the practical problem. There is also a philosophical problem. And the philosophical problem is that is called the naturalistic fallacy. Now, the naturalistic fallacy means it is a tendency to draw a conclusion about how things ought to be, how things should be based on how they are, are based on claims concerning what is natural. As if naturalness were itself a kind of authority. If insects are autocratic, so should we be, or so can we be. If insects commit suicide, so should we. So that the insects do is not, does not mean that we should do. That is the problem. And if we have this, commit this naturalist fallacy, which many people have committed, some innocently, some with criminal purposes, but many people commit this natural fallacy and they try to justify what we do in human societies by saying, oh, the bees do it too. And that is the naturalistic fallacy. My question is, I'm only going to ask questions. Answers, you are, the answers should come from you. Can we hope to learn from nature, in particular in this context, insect societies, without committing the naturalistic fallacy, without justifying our actions on the grounds that it is found in nature. Now, let me begin with some examples of what kind of things we might learn. Let me begin with some very simple examples, very easy examples. Now, there is a phenomenon called ant colony optimization. As I said, ants are very smart in many ways. So I'll take one very simple example. If there are two routes to go from nest to food, and one path is long and one path is short, the ants very quickly learn which is the short path 
and they use the short path. They do not use the long path. You can imagine that this is economical, this is beneficial, etc. But the question is, how do the ants manage this? Uh, man called John Louis de Newberg, actually a chemist, in the year 1989, did a very simple experiment in his lab, published a small paper saying that they do not use intelligence. It's not biology, but it's chemistry that makes them do this. He constructed in the lab very simple experiment where there was a nest in the lab, there was a foraging area, another plastic box in the lab, and he connected these two by a long route by glass tube, which, where the ants could use a short route or a long route. And he found that initially they chose both randomly, but very quickly, as quickly as in 30 minutes, almost all the ants discovered that this is the shortest way to get them. As you can imagine, this is very advantageous, but he showed that this is simple chemistry. He showed that the ants actually use the two randomly in the beginning, but as the ants walk along, they lay a pheromone trail. Most of you must be familiar seeing trails of ants. When ants move, they lay a, ferro a chemical signal along the way to guide other ants. And his argument, his theory was very simple, which he proved in many ways. And that is initially they use it randomly. There is some pheromone on both sides. But the ants which have accidentally chosen the shorter path will come back sooner simply because the path is short and more trips will be made on the shorter path than on the longer path without anybody designing, without anybody wishing, without anybody calculating. And wherever the, and therefore the pheromone will be stronger in the shorter path, the next ant which comes will be more likely to be attracted to the shorter path than to the longer path. And therefore, they will choose the shorter path without any calculation, without any intelligence, without any intention, without any instinct. Because this is what is called emergence. The short path emerges as the favorite simply because of physical chemical processes. This is what we call emergent properties. This, of course, is of great interest to other people in computer science, especially. And quickly, a young man called Marco Dorigo hit upon this and he started using what is, has come to be called as ant colony optimization. In fact, he coined this term, he's written a book uh, on it, and this is now actually a branch in computer science. And the lessons learned from how the ants achieve this task of choosing the shorter of two paths, that those lessons have been incorporated in producing algorithms and are being used in all kinds of things. A traveling salesman problem, routing in communication networks, algorithms for data clustering, dynamic resource sharing, graph coloring, machine scheduling, vehicle routing, sequence learning, machine learning. There's a whole lot of areas in which this is being put. This is, of course, learning from insect societies, but a relatively simple example, because we don't have to worry here about democracy, autocracy, and uh, matricide and fratricide, really straightforward. Another straightforward example, slightly more difficult, but straightforward example is learning from ant agriculture. Uh, I want to refer particularly to the work of Ulrich Mueller uh, in the University of Texas, Austin, who I think has done the most important work in this area. And among many things, he has shown that fungus farming ants originated 50 million years ago. They use leaves to cultivate fungi and they choose. Now, of course, they have serious problems of pests, of microbes, and they, of disease. And they seem to solve this problem by choosing and managing microbial consortia, beneficial both for nutrient uptake and for disease resistance. So they don't just accidentally. So they keep their cultures monoculture. They remove what they don't want and they do this by actually cultivating this consortia. And these consortia actually are cultivated on the bodies of the ants. And I'm very proud to say that one of my former students uh, went and worked with him as a postdoc, uh, Ruchira Se, and she made a significant contribution to this field of research. She published this paper in PNAs called Generalized Antifungal Activity of uh, these bacteria, which are actually growing in, on the bodies of the ants. So it's something very remarkable. There are many facets of ant agriculture and uh, Ulrich Mueller has written extensively on how we might benefit from the way they manage their agriculture, how they manage it sustainable, how they deal with diseases and so on. My third example, Again, is a relatively straightforward one, and this has to do with aerial robotics. And here I want to refer to another colleague, uh, Mandiam Srinivasan from Australia, who also did another simple, brilliant experiment. The question he was asking is, how do bees know how far they have flown? I already said when bees go, find food, come back home, they perform a dance, and tell other bees how far the food is. 
how do these bees in the first place know how far the food is how do bees estimate the distance they have flown there were two theories in the literature one said bees estimate distance flown by how tired they feel how much energy they have consumed they drink sugar set out and if you like how hungry they are at the end of the journey it turns out that this is not a very uh, good theory it doesn't support the fact there was another very more complicated more counterintuitive theory and that theory was that bees actually estimate distance by monitoring image motion on their eyes so as they move forward the image moves backwards in their eyes and they measure that and through measuring this so called optic flow they estimate now in a common sense you think this theory is far fetched the first one was easy how tired they are we can understand that might happen actually it turns out that the optic flow theory is the correct one and uh, mandeep shrin was did a very clever very simple experiment to prove this what he did was he said suppose i increase the optic flow of the bees artificially even though they are flying the same distance the distance is same but i artificially increase the optic flow the bees must overestimate must think they have gone very far and he achieved this with dramatic simplicity he constructed a plywood tunnel and he pasted computer generated patterns on the walls of the tunnel and made the bees fly through this tunnel now these the walls of the tunnel being so close to the bees of course there was enormous optic flow on the bees and as he predicted the bees in fact overestimated the distance not only he showed that they overestimated the distance but he made very detailed calculations and showed exactly by how much they overestimated the distance and by that he calibrated what might be called the honey bee odometer now this knowledge has actually become very useful and now he himself is very much involved in applying these things very briefly i have just two bullets here flying insects are intelligent micro machines capable of exquisite maneuvers in unpredictable environments understanding these system uh, systems advances our knowledge of flight control sensor suites and unsteady aerodynamics which is cru crucial is of crucial interest to engineers developing intelligent flying robots or micro air vehicles i can see that he has edited a whole book on flying insects and robotics so again this is a third example but i would say a relatively straightforward example because the domain in which we are learning from insects is relatively uncontroversial should we stop at that i don't think so particularly because i don't really do this kind of research i do a very different kind of research with my wasp societies and there if we want to learn something we are firmly in the domain of human affairs and moral philosophy these are the difficult areas so let me take the next few minutes to give you a very brief description of some of the things we have found that our wasps do and tell you why we then if we want to learn from them we are in this domain of human affairs and moral philosophy and not just agriculture and robotics and computer programs i and my students study this wasp this is much better wasp study it's not huge it does not build big nests it does not have thousands of wasps that, that was very dangerous these are small they are beautiful and the best thing is they don't build an envelope they are completely open a simple two dimensional nest you can see a few wasps here and you can watch everything you can watch the eggs the larvae the pupae the adults you can uh, inter interact with the adults adults feeding larvae larvae sometimes feed the adults all of these you can watch very easily and it's very simple so we spend all our time uh, i and my students have been engaged in studying this wasp i don't know maybe four decades and we never get tired of this no one interesting thing about this wasp unlike most ants uh, bees and even other wasps is that here there is no single large identifiable queen all the workers look identical they are nearly identical physiologically but one of them temporarily becomes a queen and she is then the sole egg layer the rest of them do work but if she dies one of the workers can transform herself into the next queen which cannot happen with ants which cannot happen with honey bees so it's a much more egalitarian system i would argue in some ways closer to humans uh, humans than uh, honey bees and ants would be we don't have a uh, we used to have kings and queens but fortunately they were not morphologically differentiated and uh, the slaves who worked for them were not uh, physiologically sterile so this sort of brings us closer to humans now 
one of the things that we do to make it possible to understand this is we have developed ways of individually identifying. Otherwise, you can see all of these walls look the same. You cannot tell which is one. When they start moving, you will not be able to keep track of them. In fact, one of them is the queen, and you can't even tell who she is until you actually see her name. But you may identify her as the queen when she lays an egg, but when she moves off again, she gets mixed up with the queen. So we actually might identify every wasp by having color coding them. So we put small spots of quick drying color paints, sometimes several spots in a very systematic way so that we have a system of nomenclature. Every wasp here has a, has a five letter code. And this code is then in our computer and we are able to maintain sometimes lifetime behavioral profiles for in identified individuals in our computer files. And therefore we can study them in great detail. As I said, if you remove, if the queen dies, one of the workers can become the queen. And this is, of course, a phenomenon of obvious interest to humans. So we have studied this phenomenon both in nature and artificial. In nature, we simply follow these colonies for long periods of time with everybody marked, hoping that the queen will die naturally. And then we will witness the succession. Who is the next one? And we keep doing this. And you can actually do this if you have patience. And I'll show you some data on this. But you can also do something else, and that is you can go with a forcer and remove the queen. And in the absence of the queen, you can witness the succession. So you can tailor make the succession. And we have used both these techniques. First, let me give you the patient one. This took years to do. So by waiting and hoping for, hoping because of the experiment, uh, I mean, I think against the queen, but waiting for the queen to die and seeing the succession, for a long time, they call me, we are able to actually construct pedigrees of the queens. I'm very proud to say that this is the first royal pedigree for insects. We humans are very used to the pedigrees. And you can see here how complex it can be. In fact, this is the most complex that we saw. Queen one was replaced by her daughter, queen two by her sister, queen three by her sister, and queen four, even though there were many more sisters, was replaced by her niece. Five was replaced by her sister, six by her sister, and seven, not by her sister, not by her niece, but by her cousin, Queen Eight. Queen Eight by her sister, Queen Nine by her daughter. So we can follow these very carefully. And because we know the relationship between these two, we can actually con conclude very interesting things. For example, we can conclude that the relationship between queens and their immediate predecessor can be that of daughters, sisters, nieces, or cousins, maybe even more distant. We just didn't wait long enough. But this, we thought, was impressive enough. Therefore, when these so-called altruistic sterile workers are working for the colony, what are they doing? They are feeding the larvae of the queen. And therefore, the relationship between these so-called altruistic workers and the brood that they are taking care of in this act of altruism, that relationship can be that of sisters, brothers, nieces and nephews, cousins, cousins offspring, mother's cousins, mother's cousin's offspring, and even mother's cousin's grand offspring. I am very fond of saying that this will put to shame any Indian joint family. This is the kind of complex family structure they live in. Why does this happen? Because when the queen dies, the workers who are the daughters of the previous queen do not stop working. They don't say, oh, now there's a new queen, I won't work. They will continue to work for the daughters of the next queen. Now, if the workers were the daughters of the old queen, and the new queen is their sister, then they start feeding their nieces. But their nieces may become the next queen, and then they will for, uh, feed the offspring of their nieces. Because workers do not stop working, workers do not die along with the queen. And you can see how close we are getting to human systems. In one study, we are interested in knowing how the queens and workers behave on the colony. And without like, by cutting a long story short, we showed that in every colony there are three kinds of wasps. We called some, we called one group sitters, another group fighters, and a third group foragers. This classification is obtained by using multivariate statistical analysis on quantitative data on how each wasp spends its day. How much time does it spend sitting, fighting, feeding, foraging? So we had this data and we subjected that to statistical analysis. There's no need to go into the details, but we found three groups of wasps, three kinds of wasps in a colony. And when we did this, we deliberately did not tell the computer who is the queen. Because now, post facto, we could ask, who is the queen in this? Is the queen a sitter, a fighter, or a courage? 
In fact, common sense suggested that queens must be fighters. Because in other species of this kind, we know that queens are very aggressive, very dominant, and they literally rule by physical dominance, by actually harassing their workers. To our great surprise, in our species, the queen is a non-aggressive, non-interactive, meek and docile city. Now we move to the experimental method, where you order a queen succession. You remove the queen. And we found, again to our great surprise, when we removed the queen, we found that one and only one worker becomes selectively hyper-aggressive. She becomes so aggressive that the level of aggression she knows, she shows on the second day when the queen is absent is many times more than what the whole colony showed on the previous. Now, if you wait for some time, this hyper-aggressive individual will slowly drop, stop her aggression and she will become the next meek and docile queen. So we call this individual the potential queen. The potential queen becomes hyper-aggressive, but quickly loses her aggression and becomes self -aggressive. So removal of the docile queen makes one worker hyper-aggressive and these individuals eventually become the queen. However, if you replace the queen soon, then she will actually stop being aggressive and go back to work. If you don't replace the queen, she stop being aggressive and, be and become a queen. So we find this very fascinating. So here, for example, so our question, of course, was an important question, which everybody used to ask us is, who is this lucky individual? Who will become the next queen if the queen dies? Can we predict who she is? Can we identify her before the old queen is dead or removed? As humans, this is of great interest. We're always curious to know who the next queen is, who the next leader is, who the next prime minister is, who the next head of the department is, who the next CEO is. We are obviously interested in this. It turns out that this is very difficult. We cannot predict. But once we remove the queen, within half an hour, we can guarantee who will be the next queen. But before removing the queen, it's very difficult. Many of my students did very detailed uh, research on this. They studied everything in great detail but we cannot predict the identity of the potential queen in the presence of the queen. The potential queen is not unique. She's not unique by any criterion, not by her dominance behavior, not by her aggression, not by her, even by her ovarian development. This graph actually shows that these potential queens are all mixed up with the workers. Only the queens are distinct. The workers and potential queens are all mixed up. So there's nothing unique, but within half an hour, one and only one individual, that is the remarkable thing. I would not go into the details because I want to talk more about can we learn, but just to give you a summary, we found to our even greater surprise that even though we cannot identify, it appears that the rest of the colony, the wasps are aware in some way of who their next queen is. So again, I'll only have time to give you the conclusion, unfortunately not the detailed experimental design. We have shown that there is a hair designate. Even though we cannot identify her in the presence of the queen, and the wasps seem to know who she is. And it is because of this, they minimize within group conflict. They minimize conflict within the group, even in the most difficult situation of being queenless, of being headless, when a new individual has to be appointed as the next week. Even in that situation, they avoid conflict, which is remarkable. So there is no conflict or the very little conflict within the colony. However, there's a great deal of conflict between colonies. You cannot expect only peace. There will always be war and peace. And we studied inter-colony conflict in the following way. When the members of one colony were introduced into the cage, of, so we had two cages. We took all the members of one colony and introduced them to another colony. So there were alien workers and resident workers. The resident workers were in their cage. They were familiar with this. They had their nest. They had their brood. Everything was peaceful. And suddenly these aliens came. Now the aliens were in strange territory, unfamiliar territory. They don't have their nest anymore. They don't have their brood anymore. They are really lost in this. And we were looking at the interaction. We were particularly interested in knowing what will the residents do to the aliens. We expected them to be very aggressive and maybe even kill them. You can't chase them away because the cage is closed. What we found was much more remarkable. The truth is often stranger than fiction. We found that the residents have a very nuanced behavior towards the aliens. They don't treat all aliens in the same way. Young alien workers were freely admitted into the colony. No problem. Come and join. Older alien workers were allowed to live, but only far away from the nest. Don't come to my nest. And the alien queen, she was located 
physically attacked and actually torn to pieces. So again, you should think of what these insects are capable of. Why they do it is another question, but they are capable of such complicated nuance behavior. And therefore, I always like to say war and peace go together. Conflict and cooperation go together. Conflict and cooperation are opposite sides of the same coin. And in fact, we can show in it that insect societies, but a small perturbation can take you from conflict to cooperation or even from conflict to, uh, co cooperation to conflict. And there is a very fine balance between these two. And that is the balance we are interested in trying to understand. And as you can again imagine, this is extremely important for human affairs and moral philosophy. The wasps have a great propensity to make war with outsiders and an equally great propensity to maintain peace with insiders. Now, from an evolutionary point of view, war with outsiders is easy to understand. It's not very difficult to explain. There's a train going by, I will stop for a minute. But war with outsiders is not as much used unless you can combine it with peace with insiders. If you have war everywhere, that's not useful. What is the point of warring with outsiders if you cannot use that to have a peaceful existence inside? And it is this dual strategy, this ability to tread a fine balance between conflict and cooperation that I believe accounts for the success of insect societies and making them what we like to call super organisms. We think of these insects as super organisms, not just organisms, because the collective, the colony works as an organism. I have time only to give you this kind of clips, but from this, I often try to reflect, compare, at least think of them. And the conclusion that I always come to is we humans are the same, aren't we? I like to quote a French philosopher, Voltaire, who made a very interesting statement. He said, it is lamentable that to be a good patriot, one must become the enemy of the rest of mankind. I will only go so far, or so far, so far, I have only gone so far as saying, when people ask me, why do you study social wars? I say, for the same reason that an anthropologist studies humans, which means I am not hiding away from the implications of this. I'm not hiding away from the comparison. I'm interested in the comparison. In fact, I am an anthropologist looking at what society rather than a society in the Andaman or Nicobar or in New Guinea or anywhere else. I am an anthropologist. So I am very conscious of this. But I have only gone so far as saying that I certainly do not think that we should imitate insect societies blindly because as I said, the good, the bad, ugly, everything is there. But I do believe that they hold a mirror to us and offer us a means to reflect on our own society and learn more about ourselves. This is something that humans always do. In fact, it's only by seeing another society, you understand yourself. It doesn't even have a society. You go to your neighbor's house, you see how they do things and you learn about yourself. Take very trivial example. You go in pre-COVID times, you could go to your neighbor's house and look at how they have arranged furniture in their drawing room and say, ah, oh, that's a very interesting way. Maybe we should also use our space more effectively as they did. Or you go to a neighbor's house and say, we are not going to treat our children that way. Similarly, when you study another society, we understand. And I have so far restricted myself saying that the advantage of studying you know, insect societies, apart from the practical uses of computer science or uh, robotics or agriculture, it helps us to understand. I have stopped at this. But now I would like to see whether we can go beyond this. Can we do better? Can we be bolder? Can we learn, be bolder in trying to learn from this? I hope that we can find a middle ground so that we can learn from insect societies without suffering the ill effects of the natural fallacy. And to do so, my prescription is as follows. I'm not saying we can learn. I'm saying if we want to learn, this is what we should do. Let us always decide what we wish to do on our own, unmindful of whether we find it in nature or not, whether the animals do the same or not. Having made a decision, however, it is often useful to turn to nature or insect societies to learn how to do it well. We saw this in the case of computer science, agriculture, robotics, 
we want to do it we want to practice agriculture we want efficient computer algorithms we want to have flying machines how to do it we can learn from insect society so even in the matter of human affairs and moral philosophy we decide what we want to do we want democracy okay now given that we want, we want democracy not because honey bees practice it we want democracy but how to make democracy work who knows there may be some lessons to learn from honey bees so we did make a decision ourselves and it is often useful to turn to nature let now in this let me begin with some non controversial examples or well, actually somewhat controversial examples now so far i have talked talk, uh, after the introduction to insects in general i talked about overworse neuropolidia and now i will move to somebody else's work on honey bees so at this point i want to acknowledge a large number of passionate students who have worked with me who have produced all of this knowledge of which i have given you only a small capsule but now i want to go and turn to the work of a friend and colleague professor thomas seely from cornell university who works on honey bees he has spent all his life on uh, working on honey bees as i have spent working on wasps and he has written this book with a very bold title honey bee democracy and i want to spend the next few minutes taking giving you a glimpse of his work and how he takes i think us one step further but quite safely in my opinion in trying to learn from insect societies i already told you about the honey bee dance language which is used for foraging but i also mentioned that it is used for making a new home so this is called house hunting and his one of his works is in how honey bees perform house hunting how do they fight let me give you very briefly these are wild honey bee colonies they like to live in cavities especially in dead trees as you see here and right on top here you see there's a little opening this is a close up of that opening this is the entrance to the bees and here is thomas seely having an artificial call, a group of bees studying them in many many interesting ways i will just and like us he also has a way of marking his bees in color card in fact this is somewhat more sophisticated this is a technique developed long time for bees where there are actually little plastic rings which you can glue to the thorax of the bee and the numbers and colors are already on this code so again you can get it but we even without this we have developed as you saw in our wasp a similar method of developing this now i want to talk to you about house hunting honey bees as studied by thomas c very briefly when a daughter colony is produced of course honey bee colonies have to reproduce to make another colony it's not enough if the workers are born when a daughter colony is produced the mother colony always leaves the nest with a fraction of the workers to build a new nest it never happens that the mother says tells the daughter you go maybe you take some worker you build it i am quite happy here i am used to this house this never happens every time the mother leaves and undertakes a risky journey and undertakes uh, undergoes quite a bit of mortality because she may not succeed in finding a new home and build it but it's always the mother who does it altruism the mother queen and her entourage of workers first settle in a cluster nearby and may remain there for a few hours maybe to a few days from this swarm a few scout bees will fly out in search of suitable cavities see they need another cavity and they are looking for a cavity but they are very very fussy about what kind of cavity they measure the volume of the cavity they look at where the entrance to the cavity is in terms of the sunlight they look at possibility of rain going inside the possibility of it getting overheated the possibility of predators finding so again uh, celia and others have studied this extensively bees make a very very detailed examination of available sites and they are very choosy about what they find. multiple scout therefore one will not do multiple scouts will go in different direction find something and they will advertise different potential nesting sites that they have visited and found attractive how do they advertise the same dance language distance direction quality same just like food now this is where the interesting thing starts this is impressive but much more interesting is the following but all the bees have to eventually go to a single location and hopefully to the best site among the flowers now this is very different from foraging honey bees if several bees go and find different trees with flowers they all come back and advertise different directions no problem some bees will go to this tree some will go to that tree even though one is much better than the other they can harvest fruit from everywhere now the bees have a very difficult problem everybody has to agree 
where to go and they have to go to a single place and hopefully the best place not some one of the randomly chosen places can, can the bees do this yes they do question is how do they do and that's what tom sigi show, work shows us how do they accomplish this no mean task of agreeing coming to a consensus all of them going to the same new place and hopefully the best of all available options this is what the bees have to accomplish with their little pin head sized brains and tom sigi provokes our imagination by saying these homeless insects will do something truly amazing they will hold a democratic debate to choose their new home and he describes this debate and i will describe it to you this is a schematic so what you find here are schematics of trees with cavities there's one on the left side there's one on the right side there are two possible options and what you see here is here is in red one bee dancing in favor of this side and a blue bee dancing in favor of this side this is how it begins very quickly there will be more bees there will be but only two are dancing to the left side and six are dancing to the right side eventually most of them are advertising the right side only a few and everybody goes to the right side this is how they make the decision this is the process of democracy but we'll go into the details this is a schematic this is real data so here is one particular example so it is 11 am to 1 pm there are 18 bees 68 dancers to different feeding sites you can see 1 2 3 4 5 that's it and the popularity of these sites waxes and wanes it increases decreases maybe some new sites come into the picture it it may take as long in this case it went from 28 july they could not come to addition till 22nd july but on 22nd july at between 9 and 11 you can see there was only one site that was being advertised by all the bees and they all took off how to do this extremely interesting but this can only be understood by very detailed very painstaking observation of the bees how do they have this collective decision making the strength of their dancers is proportional to their assessment of the absolute quality of the site they are for in the case of food the strength of the dancers is proportional to the quality of the food they are for here the strength of the dancers is proportional to the quality of the nesting site but the interesting thing is that the bees have an absolute assessment of quality not relative they have an inborn meter if you like and through that meter they read off this colony okay this gets 80% or this gets 70% and then their dance will be according to that no matter what other uh, sites are there no matter what other bees say what i have measured the quality of this and i dance appropriately now as you can imagine if i make a strong dance i'll have many followers if i have weak dance i'll have fewer followers so a good dance a good site will elicit a strong dance and result in more followers who will also visit that site and return to perform even more strong dances because in absolute term that's good on the other hand a poor site will elicit a weak dance result in few followers who will visit that site and return to perform weak dances everything is see it's automatic it's almost like the pheromone in the ants nothing is being designed hence the number of bees that will dance in favor of the good side and poor side will increase and decrease exponentially no scope for conflict once a consensus reached scouts who are most familiar with the winning side will invite and lead the whole group to their new home by making piping sounds to take off and releasing pheromones at the destination the crucial point is that the bees will only dance according to their absolute assessment they will not go into competition and say you are dancing strongly i will dance even more strongly no they are just faithful to what they have found it's not their popularity it's not their ego and that is why the system works this is a picture of the what happens at the destination one of the bees will stand like this bend the last segment of abdomen and release the pheromone saying friends we have arrived this is our new place now when tom sealy is extracted the key wisdom of the honeybees and what is the key wisdom their decision is based on attaining a quorum and not a consensus in the end as you will find that schematic there were still two dancing for the left side so they do not wait till everybody agrees this is very important because consensus rather than quorum means that a single stubborn bee cannot hold the group to ransom 
endlessly delaying decision. It's impossible not to think of committees where we have sat uh, and found this problem. Bees whose initial sites fall out of favor retire from the competition and let others decide whether to persist advertising for their site or not. If you don't like my site, so be it. I'm not going to pretend that it is better than it is. This is the difference. I've already said this is the difference because I think we don't behave like this. Now, Tom Seeley went beyond that. He then actually explicitly compared this to human, humans. Uh, this is very interesting. So there are these, he talks about town meetings in Bradford, Vermont, USA. Once a year on town meeting day, traditionally the Tuesday following the first Monday in March, the citizens in a town come together in an open face-to-face -face assembly and render binding collective decisions or, or laws <coughs> that govern the actions of everyone in their town. This is how the town functions. <coughs> now, he looking at the bees and looking at the town meetings, Tom Seeley has extracted five, what he calls five habits of effective groups. First, Compose the decision-making group of individuals with shared interest and mutual respect. Minimize the leader's influence on the group thinking. Seek diverse solution to the problem. Aggregate the group's knowledge through debate and use quorum's responses for cohesion, accuracy, and speed. These five, if you perform, if you use, then you can function effectively. And that's what you and what I like very much is that first Tom Seeley studies bees, he extracts the wisdom, then he looks at human beings and he sees it, it work and combining these two, but he doesn't stop there. He says, can we learn from this? I'm going to put it in practice. And he writes very movingly, movingly in his book that just when he was thinking about this, he's, he was appointed head of the department and he had to conduct faculty meetings. And he said, can I use this? Departmental faculty meetings. As if this were not charming enough, Seeley tells us how he himself adopted these five habits of effective groups in conducting faculty meetings in his department when he became chair of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at Cornell University, Ithaca. And he says, of course, it's for others to decide whether it was successful or not, but he said he found it very easy to take very complex decisions on very naughty problems because he used these five and these are, these are very, very important. So the decision move, there should be mutual interest and mutual respect, but the leader itself not important. So he himself did not say, I am going to decide what to do. So he, and this is, a, the book is really worth reading. So I want to sort of digress now from that and make a more general. So because of this danger of naturalistic fallacy, because people have used, you know, uh, if there is very good evidence that even the Nazis used some of these uh, principles to decide what they should do. So there has been tremendous misuse of what we find in nature. And because of that, some philosophers say that we should forget about nature. Nature is not a guide. Nature is not useful. We should do everything ourselves. Now, I don't agree with this. This doesn't work because nature is not a good guide to decide what we should do. But I think nature is a good guide to decide how we should do. And I think this is just Distinction is very subtle. It would be a shame if we say nature is nothing we are by ourselves. We are nature. There are 10 to 30 million species. We are one of them. There is no corner outside nature for us to say that we will. I'm very influenced by this book called Biophilia by Edward Wilson. And like Wilson, I say, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are over 10 million biological species out there, at least 10, probably 30 some people each with potentially something to teach us. Natural selection has worked tirelessly for over 1.8 billion years to shape them and endow them with diverse, exquisite properties. Edward o. Wilson has coined the inspiring term biophilia to describe our innate tendencies to focus on life. And that tendency is innate. You can't give it away. Humanity is exalted not because, I'm quoting from Wilson, Humanity is exalted not because we are so far above other living creatures, but because knowing them will elevate the very concept of life. There is no corner for us to hide outside nature. Do we really want to go so against nature that we shut ourselves in a corner and ignore all other species as potential sources of knowledge and wisdom? 
just because we are afraid that someone will draw the wrong lessons and harm fellow human beings it would not be hope the most intelligent species on the planet to be so terrified of what we might discover about our co-inhabitants let us have the self confidence to raise our children to love fellow human beings and the rest of nature in equal measure and let us have the sapiens to distinguish right from wrong and justify the name homo sapiens let us resolve i gave this talk some time back on the national science day and i said let us resolve and i think we should resolve on this every day it doesn't have to be just a national science day i want to end very briefly by saying that we should communicate we should discuss this science is not just a body of facts science is a method of discovering and verifying facts science is best practice as a way of life not merely a 9 to 5 occupation above all science is more fun than fun and to communicate this i now write a fortnightly column in the wire science which actually says this says so idea is to spread the joy and spirit of science and this talk is based on one article which was published in this in this column which you in which you can get uh, more details uh, i have enjoyed talking to you i hope you have enjoyed listening to me thank you very much thank you so much sir uh, sir it was a wonderful talk uh, and uh, we also got to know so many uh, things about insects and their societies what all things good things are there about you know what we can invite into our society and so on. so thank you so much for the wonderful talk sure. uh, we are getting lot of comments okay. uh, from participants okay. that stop sharing also, screen uh, wonderful it, session yeah. shall i stop sharing screen yes yes sir there yeah. too take questions etc wonderful yes so we yes. have a question uh, yes. by shilpa shilpa you can you can ask uh, it yourself yeah so i wanted to know that while we do color coding to the uh, ants or the insect uh -huh. uh, does it affect the experiment like uh, because the other ants would also recognize their friends in some other color i don't know whether they uh, understand the colors But, uh, but due to color coding does it make any uh, difference in their behavior the question is certainly worth asking but not easy to answer so first we when we did this we tried to see whether there's any obvious effect of this and there was no obvious effect but that's not enough because the effect may not be so obvious so one of my students conducted a very carefully detailed controlled study one uh, some colonies with marks and some colonies without marks and by using statistics etc we tried to see whether there is anything special about the marked wasp versus the unmarked wasp and we failed to find anything but again i would say that as far as we can tell there is no effect one should always be cautious as far as we can tell it does not seem to affect i can imagine that for certain kinds of things it will affect but for the kinds of things that we study as far as we can tell it does not seem to matter okay thank you sure thank you uh, we have one more question by manjusha thakke and she is asking that is the cell signaling has any important role for communication among Sorry, the ants first part or here. i didn't any hear any other related species no first okay. part i didn't hear so the question is uh, is the cell signaling has any important role for communication among the ants or any other related uh, species of insects cell signaling does the cell signaling has any important role cell signaling for communication uh, i do, do not know if cell see cell signaling happens at am, am i hearing correctly cell cell to cell signaling right is that what is being said right yes yes yes, okay. yes. No, cell to cell yes. signaling it happens at the cellular level so it's entirely conceivable that these things eventually cascade into the level of the whole organism behavior but we know so little about this unfortunately those who study cell biology don't study organism biology those who study organism biology don't study cell biology and we live in two different worlds so it's entirely possible that it begins at as a cell to cell and cascades into an whole organism bear but we have no idea we we study only at the organism level and uh, some people study only at cell to level this bridge has not this gap has not been bridged so i would not know and it's neither very so easy to bridge the gap yes go ahead prachi yeah 
Yes, so we have next question by uh, Dr. Sujata Bhargav. Uh, so hello, ma'am. So she is asking that how do how do the scout deals who have found different sites for their new hives debate to reach a consensus? Reach a common consensus. How do they what? Last part. How do they uh, reach a common consensus? Okay, so this is how it happens. How do the scout deals? Okay, yeah. I'll tell you what. So let's take a very simple case. Let's say there are only two scouts. One scout goes to a site which is not so good. One scout goes to a site which is very good. Now, the bees will make an honest assessment of their site. They will not say, I found this site, therefore I, it's a great site. They have an honest assessment. So the bee, the scout which has found a not so good site will come and perform a weak dance. The bee, the scout which has found a very good site will come and perform, come back and perform a strong dance. Now, the bees at home, more bees will be attracted to the strong dance few bees will be attracted to the weak dance. Now, the more, lots of bees who have been attracted to strong dance will go and say, let me find out for myself. They will go and since they also make an honest assessment, they find it very strong. So, they will all come back and perform more strong dances. The few bees who have been attracted to the weak dance will say, let me go and see. They will go and see. They say, yeah, it's not such a great site. So, they will come back and they'll perform a weak site. Now, now think of the rest of the bees. Now, many more bees will get attracted to the strong dance, fewer to the end, and there's an exponential bifurcation. So, the uh, big site will lose out in this competition, not because the original bee is saying anything, but because of this automatic phenomenon. So, there is an automatic divergence in the numbers. So, popular, it's a popularity context. But the important thing is that the bee which has visited the not so good site will not change. She will not now suddenly become dance stronger because I'm losing. Let me try and gain some popularity by actually bluffing. She will not do that. Not only she will not do that, she will not dance anymore. She dances and says, now those who have watched my dance, gone and seen for years, you decide. If you think it's good, make a, make a strong dance. I, so there is no ego involved. That is the thing. That is why they're able to make this decision. And yet it is consensus. Oh. Uh, it's quorum and not consensus. Everybody doesn't have to agree. As long as a substantial number agree, they make the final decision. So you, you think of a committee in which there are 20 people. If 15 people say yes, then the rest say, okay, we'll go along. What can we do? That is the kind of thing. The majority decision. Yes, yes. it's a majority. That's okay, so Four, we have one more question. Uh, so Shilpa is asking that. Yeah. So how do we identify sister, cousin, and like sister means cousin, bees, etc. How do they identify? We identify how they identify. Both are good questions. <laughs> we identify by yeah. well, there are two ways. One is by observation. So if you have all the wasps marked and you know who is the queen, who is laying eggs, then the offspring born are her sons and daughters. Then you mark them. Then let us say one of the daughters of the queen becomes the next queen then you know that. And now she will produce offspring. And we know that they are her offspring. And we know therefore that they are nieces of the workers of the previous week. So we follow this literally. We have followed it for years. And so we actually know. But there are also shortcuts. You can use a shortcut if you have a lot of money. You can grind up the wasps. You can extract their DNA. And by looking at the genes shared, or microsatellites shared, you can estimate what is the amount of relatedness. And therefore, it's, is it at sibling level or cousin or niece level? There are two problems with this. One is that it is very expensive, which is maybe all right. But the other is that the wasp is dead. You can't do anything more with this information. In our method, we then follow these things. So there are two ways of doing it. Now, there's also an interesting question. Do the wasp know? And there is good evidence that they know. And that is even harder to understand. They do not extract DNA, that is for sure. They <laughs> do the watching, what we do. But in a very interesting way. In fact, in many aspects of animal behavior, if we study in detail, how do they do this? The answer always is they have a shortcut. They have a thumb rule. So this has been very well studied in some species. For example, a bird will have the following thumb rule. If an adult bird seems very familiar to me, then that bird must have been my sibling in my nest and therefore I will not mate with that bird. They have a very thumb rule. So often familiarity is taken 
as an index of relatedness. This is also being worked out. So animals have very interesting mechanisms of kin recognition, and we have ways of telling this. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, the question is, humans and insects, bees especially, uh, social behavior are in convergent to evolution. Uh, is, it, is it anything to do with evolution? Sorry, the social behavior. Yeah, so uh, sorry, humans and can... insects. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in humans and insects, especially the bees, the social behavior isn't convergent to evolution, or is there anything to do with evolution? Basically, the question is the behavior, yes. the social behavior. Yes, is evolution it related to evolution. Yes, everything is based on evolution. So their behavior is also shaped by evolution. Our behavior is also shaped by evolution. That is the fundamental process by which these things happen. Uh, they are evolving, we are evolving, and there are so many ways in which you could show that. You could, of course, do that through uh, phylogenetic reconstruction, you can do that through fossils, you can do that through molecular data, but you can also actually, now there are much more powerful techniques. There are very powerful techniques where you can actually assess how strong is natural selection acting on a particular part of the DNA by looking at its distribution. So you can actually measure the strength of selection in different parts of the genome of different organisms. So obviously all parts of the genome are not responding to selection in the same way. Some there is much strong selection, there is some weak selection. So there is abundant evidence that evolution and selection is shaping these things. One of the reasons why we find it somewhat hard to believe is that it's a, such a slow process. We are used to things happening in days, there things happen in hundreds of thousands of years or, not, or sometimes in millions of years. But we have abundant evidence that there is an evolutionary process going on in humans, in insects, in all living creatures. So uh, this question, if I'm not wrong, this was asked by a sixth standard student. Very good. Uh, so the the good question one. was asked by a sixth standard student. So yes. Yeah, very happy. Uh, those, are the good, those are the good questions. Okay, so, uh, these were the Yes. No, there is one more uh, question so by Adi. Questions? Sure. No, there is one more question just come in. Uh, so should I read it for okay, you, so have... uh, Raghavendra? Yeah, please. I'll read it. Yeah. Wasp selection of new queen does not seem to be random since the sisters, daughters, etc. of previous queen get selected. Is there something like lineage, etc.? Is there royal blood, royal lineage? Uh, that is the question. Question. See, first of all, I have said sister, daughter, sister, niece, cousin. What else is there? So it is everybody is eligible. And as I said, if we had waited longer, we might even have second cousins or third cousins. So it does not look like there it is selected uh, selectively for anybody. There does not because there is no evidence of that happening. But nevertheless, the question remains: How is it decided? That we don't know. But there is no it, there is no genetic line. So actually, Raghavendra, you are talking about democracy in a huge joint family. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Which is not so easy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I don't think there are any more questions. Prachi, uh, you want to wind up? Uh, no, sir. No. We can't. Yeah. Uh, yes. so it, you want to? It was, it was really a very wonderful talk. Thank and uh, we all enjoyed, you know, listening to all of this. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation and giving a session, a webinar. On behalf of Pune Knowledge Cluster, I thank you. Raghavendra, thank you so much. Thank From you. I enjoyed Ajit, myself. Shashi, myself and all our entire team and also the participants. Thank you. So thank much. you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.